From the New Revised Standard Version, Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone from the tomb entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead to, for you to get up Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be The women who came to Jesus' tomb on Easter morning knew that Jesus was dead. They were there at the crucifixion from beginning to end. They saw him die and watched the soldiers pierce his side to be sure that he was dead before the Sabbath began at sundown. They saw him taken down the limp from the cross, and they followed as he was taken and placed in a tomb. When you watch someone executed and see that person taken to a grave and buried, you make certain assumptions and you come away with certain expectations. And at the top of the list of those assumptions and expectations is that if you return to the grave in a couple of days, the body is still gonna be there. That's what the women expected when they came to the tomb of Jesus on Sunday morning. And we can hardly fault them for it. The only concern the women had that morning was how they were going to move the big rock that had been used to seal off the tomb. As they approached, they discovered, discovered that somebody had taken care of the stone, but they still expected that the body of Jesus was going to be inside. And they entered to do what they had come to do, to anoint Jesus' body with burial spices and pay their last respects. When they got inside, however, things were not as they expected. There was no body, just an angel with the strange news that Jesus was alive and gone on ahead of them to Galilee. How did the women respond? If you'll excuse the pun, they were scared stiff. <laughs> Verse 8, which is where the scripture reading ended this morning, is how the oldest manuscripts of the book of Mark end. They discover Jesus is not in the tomb, and they are afraid. No dancing in the streets, no celebration of the resurrection, fear. Just when everybody thought they knew what had happened and how they were going to handle it, something else has now thrown a wrench into the works. That's not to say that the women and the other disciples were not devastated by Jesus' death, or that they, they would eventually be overjoyed to have him back among them. But the fear of the women when Jesus is not where he's supposed to be is relatable, because it's typical of our own response to the unexpected and the unknown. We may not like the situation in which we find ourselves, but at least if it will stay the same, we can learn how to live with it. When we know what to expect, we can plan and have some sort of stabilizing routine in our lives. It's one of the reasons that the pandemic remains so hard psychologically. 
If anything, it's getting harder because it won't stay the same. New variants, new symptoms, new protocols. As soon as we get used to one thing, there's a new twist. I told some of you this past week that planning church these past two years has felt like a giant video game where you walk around and you step on the wrong square and then you have to reset everything and start again from the beginning. We humans value at least a little bit of stability. And the last week of Jesus' life for his disciples and followers had been anything but. For that matter, nothing about the life of Jesus was typical, nor was it the expected path for a messianic figure. Nobody expected the Messiah to come as a baby in a manger, born to a poor carpenter family from Nazareth of all places. Mary and Joseph definitely did not expect to find their 12-year-old son perfectly at home teaching in the temple. They had gotten halfway home and saw he wasn't there. They thought he was lost. They go back to Jerusalem and there he is, doing what? At 12? Miracles, by definition, are unexpected. And Jesus performed a lot of them. Throughout Jesus' ministry, people were surprised and often dismayed to see the kinds of people that Jesus chose to associate with. The disciples didn't understand what he was doing, debating doctrine with a Samaritan woman, or even why they were in Samaria in the first place. Jews didn't go there. They tried keeping the annoying children away from Jesus so that he could tend to adult matters. But Jesus scolded them when they were just trying to help. And finally, the whole city of Jerusalem turned on him because he refused their expectations that he be an earthly king who would overthrow the Romans and instead let himself be arrested and killed. The long-expected Jesus we sing about in Advent did a lot of expectation-busting things during his life. And now this. Even the simplest child could tell you that dead bodies sealed in tombs don't get up and go anywhere. But even in death, Jesus stubbornly refused to do what all convention and protocol said he should do, namely to stay dead. As we sit here on Easter morning some 2,000 years later, I'd like us to think about the ways that we might be like those women who came to the tomb. Or for that matter, like any of the people who found themselves puzzled, offended, scandalized, and somewhat frightened by the unexpected Jesus. One of the primary ways that we fall short in our faith is by trying to shape God into a God who will meet our expectations. We seek to mold God into an image that we're comfortable with, a God who looks like us who votes like us, who loves who we love and fights a common enemy. We feel much more at ease when we're sure we know exactly what God thinks about every issue, when we know exactly how God will act in every circumstance, and when we can find the absolute boundary for who's going to get into heaven and who's going to go to hell. We're perhaps most comfortable when we can keep the entirety of our religion in the church building, when we can come here when we want to pay our respects and be reasonably sure that God is not going to leave here and go intruding on our day-to-day -day lives. We can come to the cross, we can weep at the feet of Jesus and feel righteous, but before we leave, we want to make sure he's nailed up there, right? He's not going to be getting down and coming out and messing with what I want to do the rest of the week. I can just put this behind me for now and get on with the rest of my life, can't I? We find ourselves wary of a Jesus who is missing from the tomb. A Jesus who is not where he's supposed to be. We have crafted large and complex systems to determine and enforce where Jesus is and is not allowed to be, who he may and may not bless, 
who he will and won't admit to paradise. We've sealed off those places and situations with heavy stones. We've set guards at the entrance. And then we show up at one of those places only to find that the stone is gone and there's some strange guy saying, nope, sorry, he's not here. You know, try Galilee, but really, who knows? He can be pretty hard to track. It's infuriating and scary. To be clear, it's not that he is alive part that scares us. He is alive is the joy, amazement, and the glory that pulls the alleluias from our lips every Easter. Because he lives, we too shall live. Yes, we are here for that. Easter finds us oh so ready to be done with the wilderness of Lent. The theme of things being finished and battles being won fill the hymns of Easter. And yes, the victory over death represented in Jesus' re resurrection is a huge deal. But there is more to the angel's message. And it's that extra bit, the he is not here part, that we find problematic. Part of that discomfort is wondering if Jesus is out of doing something heretical again, crossing lines that we have expressly forbidden, feeding people who didn't work for their meal or some such thing. But an even worse explanation for Jesus rushing off to Galilee without so much as a, hey, I'm back to his followers, is that maybe that means it isn't actually over. Death may be swallowed up in victory, but maybe the work of the living Jesus is only now just beginning. To date, Jesus' followers have been merely disciples. A disciple is one who learns from a master. But they are about to move from being disciples to become apostles. Mm -hmm those who are sent out. The time of discipleship has come to an end for them. Mark tells us about Easter morning, but it's John who continues the story into Easter night, transporting us to a house where all the disciples, except for Thomas and Judas, who has committed suicide, were hiding behind locked doors in fears of their own arrest and execution. Jesus appears among them, the first they've seen him. But he's not there to chit-chat or share fond memories of, hey, remember that time you walked on water? <laughs> he's coming to them with an assignment. As the Father has sent me, so I send you, Jesus tells them. Then he breathes the Holy Spirit into them. Think of how those words must have landed, given their previous 72 hours. As amazing as the news of Jesus' resurrection was, the external realities in first century Israel had not changed. Rome still ruled the East, and was still bent on rooting out any vestiges of the Jesus movement. <laughs> In the book of Acts, we first meet Paul while he is still diligently engaged in hunting down and murdering any followers of Jesus that he can find. The disciples were all in hiding, fearing that as Jesus' most public disciples, they now had targets on their backs. John was the only one who had dared to even show his face at the crucifixion. And now here's Jesus, somehow alive again, passing the torch. The work that just got Jesus crucified is now theirs to continue. Only now the danger is amped up to 11. Uh, thanks. Good news, most assuredly. But it must have been pretty hard to absorb in the moment. And unsettling to think about unlocking those doors and going back out to a crowd who's no longer in the mood for hosannas. 
but they did. Willingly, gladly, and we are here because of it. As far as we know, the only one of the original 12 disciples to live out a natural life was John. Jesus was dead, and then he wasn't. The women were afraid, the disciples were afraid, and then they weren't. The living Christ filled them, empowering them to spread the good news, to heal the sick, to set people free, to light fires of loving community that would come to be called the church. And in their turn, the disciples passed the torch to those communities. As Jesus sent them, so they sent the church, each in succession down through the millennium. And every Easter, that torch comes again to us. He is risen, and he's gone on ahead of us to Galilee. The work of Jesus the man is finished. The work of the living Christ goes on in us. It will live. Amen. Amen.